address what may arguably be the most important development of the year concerning Israel. What I'm speaking of is how the jury may be out on whether or not the U.S. President vetoes an upcoming U.N. Security Council resolution. As it turns out, who knew, Obama is the only one who now holds the key to stop the latest Palestinian attempt at the UN to divide Jerusalem under the banner of the so-called two-state solution. It's important to note that this is happening, upcoming, amidst what I like to call a perfect prophetic storm which has been forming and even now continues to form as we speak. By perfect prophetic storm, I mean this. There are numerous prophecies in the Bible that today are converging on the geopolitical horizon. Uh, we're going to come back to the upcoming UN resolution, but I think it'd be good to quickly look at what is actually making up this perfect prophetic storm. What follows is neither exhaustive nor in any particular order. Uh, it's just a, a handful of what I see as significant prophecies that are today in play. And I want to start with the recent breaking news concerning the increase of sizable earthquakes three of which were in Japan. Yesterday, CNN reported on the third earthquake, which was a magnitude 7.3, and it hit early Saturday morning. This after a 6.0 earthquake the day before, also in Japan on Friday, and that was before a 6.2 earthquake that hit the day before, also in Japan on Thursday, making for a total of three massive earthquakes in Japan in the span of just three consecutive days, and it gets worse. Uh, actually, we've had at least one massive earthquake every day for the last five days since Wednesday of last week, including today, with a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. I don't know if you heard about this. It hit early this morning in Ecuador. Um, this uh, was from CNN uh, late last night, which was early morning in Ecuador, but at that time it was 28 that were reported dead. Well, this morning on Fox News, it's, it's climbing ever so high and ever so fast, and it's over 200, and they expect it to even rise more. You have to understand that with earthquakes, a, a 6.0 earthquake is 10 times greater than a 5. But a 7-point earthquake is 10 times greater than the 6.0 earthquake that's 10 times greater than the 5. You're, you're staying with me on this? Now, take that to an 8, which is exponentially greater because that's 10 times greater than a 7, which is 10 times greater than a 6, which is 10, and so forth and so on. When you talk about a 7.8 earthquake, that is a huge earthquake. Anywhere near that 8 is a huge, devastating earthquake. Now, here's the thing. Um, I'm learning a, a thing or two about this from my uh, friend Tom Eagle. He's our in-house genius. Uh, if you've never had a chance to talk with Tom Eagle, you need to do so. He keeps me apprised of what's going on with this. And Thursday night after our midweek Bible study, he was showing me this app on his iPad that tracks what is known as the KP index. Uh, the KP index, in layman's terms, is the Global Geomagnetic Storm Index based on three-hour measurements of the geomagnetic activity relative to a calm day curve for the given location. For the most part, using this index they're better able to predict an approximate time and general location for potential earthquakes to hit. And what's interesting is that before the Japan quakes and now Ecuador this morning, on Wednesday, 
there was a 6.9 in Myanmar in which the KP index was 5. That's the red zone. 5 is not good. <laughs> you want it to be 1, 2, 3. But when it hits 5 and it goes to 9, uh, it can be catastrophic. And tomorrow it's going to be at 4 after going down to a 3 and then back up. Now here's why this is significant. Just this morning uh, when I got here before a prayer meeting, Donna was showing me her USGS uh, uh, app where it recorded, and this is when I first walked in, there were 46 earthquakes uh, just today. And then by the time we uh, started the prayer meeting, it had gone up to 50. I don't know what it is at now, but these are earthquakes that are in a variety of places. That should trigger something we're going to talk about uh, in just a moment. I think you know where I'm going with this, but this is what's interesting. And then this, just this morning, I got a, um, uh, uh, an email from one of our online members uh, telling me that there are swarms now of earthquakes, like the whole, the whole earth is sort of trembling. Uh, I chose that word for a reason. And uh, wobbling. And it, it's showing these charts all over on the mainland. I looked for Hawaii. I didn't, didn't find it, so, uh, <laughs> but, because uh, we're right smack in what's known as the ring of fire, which is where these major earthquakes are taking place. Um, it's also interesting to know, and this was from another online member that, uh, and I, th I think I got my numbers right, there's uh, right now 32 volcanoes that are active simultaneously in real time. This is unprecedented, unprecedented. And it is certainly unprecedented to see these types of earthquakes, magnitude earthquakes, happening in these places uh, with this frequency and this intensity. And this, of course, is what Jesus said would take place as a sign of his soon return when he answered the question the disciples asked about, it was really a twofold question, what will be the signs of your return and of the end of the age? And so Jesus then, from that point on, goes on to answer their question. And in verse 4, Matthew 24 says, watch out that no one deceives you. In other words, there's going to be a deception on a grand scale. And that'll be a sign of his soon return. When somebody stands in my face and says, we're going to fundamentally change America, I am reminded what my fundamentals are. First of all, my fundamental foundation is the Christian faith. Secondly, my fundamental foundation is the church in America. Thirdly, my fundamental foundation is marriage is between a man and a woman. My faith, my freedoms, my family, mm-hmm. And the fact of looking at God's word and making it the foundation. Great Lord, I think it's time to give you the word the Lord gave. The Spirit of the Lord said to me, He said, Now, son, I'm going to tell you prophetically why that the top of the National Cathedral shook, but the foundation stayed sure. I'm going to tell you why the top of the Washington Monument has three cracks out of four places, but the foundation remained. I said, Lord, speak on. He said, son, it's because there's a whole group of people that came to power who said, I'm going to fundamentally change it. But God says the foundation of America is too strong for a group of left-wing liberal politicians politicians and left-wing liberal leaders to come and shake that foundation. I don't mind preaching right here. What is the foundation of America? It's a group of founders that were Christians. What is the foundation of America? It's the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that is based upon the Word of God and upon Scripture. What is the foundation of America? It's preachers and politicians allowing each other to pray and have freedom to pray and call on God 
in public places. What is the foundation of America? In the early days, our presidents called people to fasting and all called people to prayer. What is the foundation of America? It's revival. And I'm telling you, as long as this Tennessee preacher has got breath in his body and blood flowing through his veins, I will tell you, you, sir, and you, ma'am, will not change the foundation and the fundamentals of a nation that's built on a covenant with Almighty God. You might shake at the top, but you're not going to shake at the bottom. Hallelujah! About these most recent visions that you've had because I don't think in terms of Perry Stone getting prophetic end time visions but has this been going on your whole walk in the Lord? Or? Yeah in 1996 and I won't go into detail about this when I saw the Trade Center shrouded in black with five gray tornadoes coming off of it. Our partners heard me t to preach this in 1999 and when, when the Trade Center attack happened I knew that's what that was. I had an incident, uh, I, I talked about this publicly off the coast of Louisiana, there would be an oil rig, something happened to an oil rig that would cause the economy to, to really have havoc there. And I even called a pastor in Louisiana and told him when the BP oil spill happened, it was a fulfillment of the five things I saw. The most recent one said, however, it deals with tsunamis. I probably once every two weeks, I'll have a, a, a dream of a tsunami. And the odd Once thing, every two weeks, oh, every, I don't want that to it, slip by. It's, it's getting, I don't mean this in a negative, it's, it's getting ridiculous almost to the number of times it happens. And my wife keeps saying, why are you keep having these? I said, honey, the only thing I can figure is the Lord's given us a warning. The odd thing is one, one appeared to have been on the West Coast and the other was very strong on the East Coast, which I thought was a little odd. But let me just tell you where I was, and I'm not going to name the city. I'm going to ask people never to contact me and ask me. I will only release it if the Holy Spirit tells me, mm -hmm. because it creates fear in people, right. and you, you, we shouldn't do that. However, um, we were in a we were near we were near water in this vision, and my wife and I and my family were together, and it was a two-story duplex. It's almost like we were staying in the area, and I, there, I saw the city. It's a very beautiful city. And uh, uh, the dark clouds were forming above it, and I knew a storm was coming. A storm can be spiritual, it can be natural. And uh, when I turned, I remember telling my wife, and I'm, I'm reducing parts of this to get to the point, uh, we, something big is about to happen. We've got to get everybody into safety. Something big is about to happen. And I went over to the, uh, the, the top story now, I'm on the second floor. I looked through this glass window, huge, beautiful glass window, and you could see two things. You could see a very beautiful bridge, and you could see water. And all of a sudden, three things happened at once. The first thing is I saw, you, you've seen the big interstate signs that tell you what city you're going to. Of course. This one named a city that I'll leave out. But this bridge connects to that city, because I checked it out the next day on a map of, of this type of bridge. And I saw a tsunami wave hit. I... I, I I don't want to estimate, it could have been 50 to 70 feet high. It was the biggest thing I've ever seen. And when it came in, then I saw the bridge buckle and the bridge collapse. Now, it almost looked to me as though the bridge was, there was an explosion at the base of the bridge. And I couldn't figure if the tsunami was caused by some kind of sea explosion and the bridge was separate. But here's what I did see that shocked me. I saw, the only way for me to describe this is to talk, to say they were the, it was the Twin Towers coming up out of the water in a ghostly look, real ghostly, real, uh, uh, not, a, not a hologram, but it was just like a, like a ghost. I, this is the only way I can describe it. And they came up out of the water and disappeared into the atmosphere, and this wave came in and was hitting the first and second levels of these buildings. And when I saw the Trade Center, the first thing when I woke up, I said, oh, Lord, or I came out of this vision. I call it a dream vision because it's very real, very precise. Mm -hmm. The first thing I thought about was, okay, was the bridge in a terrorist attack? Did they get underneath the bridge right. and blow a bridge up? That was my first thought because I saw the towers, which was a terrorist attack. So I'm not sure if the bridge is connected to the terrorist attack, but the tsunami was natural. But I'm telling you, it is, it is absolutely... Uh, 
Sid, in one and a half, in ten days, I had three dreams of a tsunami. But they were three-dimensional, full color. You know the difference between just a dream and what I but, call but a the, night dream. But you know the fact that it's you keep having these it's same, dreams. It's the same. This yeah. tells me that it's yeah. going to happen in a short period. Of yeah, time. and in one of them, I never will forget this. There was a solid white rock, a solid white rock. When the 9/11 attack happened, and I had the vision of the tower shrouded in black, I'm running down, saying, "We have to get in the rock. We have to get in the rock. The rock is Christ." And I was saying when I had the 9-11 vision in 1996, and some of the folks that followed our ministry will know that. And we had pictures. I had pictures drawn of it in 1999. And you know about that. And I remember saying twice, we have to get to the cleft of the rock. We have to hide in the rock, which is Christ. Uh, just a few weeks ago when I had the one tsunami dream, I was climbing into. You know what the garden tomb looks like in Israel? Of course. It was, this was solid rock with an opening. And the water was not coming into this opening that I was into. It was passing me. But it was just water everywhere. And the Lord just showed me. He said, this is the cleft of the rock. The, I am the rock. I'm the foundation. And all people need to understand is be hidden in me. Be hidden in my presence. Know my presence. Know how to pray. Know how to walk with me. And I would say this to anybody watching me right now, and that is the greatest thing I could say to you with the last days is what Jesus said, do not be afraid. Believers don't have to be afraid. The world has to be afraid. You know, you know, sinners should be terrified, okay? If I'm a sinner, I would be terrified. But, but not, not the believer that knows the end of the story. But we have to be informed. We have to be informed to inform our loved ones who are not saved. I want people to know, have knowledge, be informed, not to be in darkness that the day overtakes us unaware. But you've got to fill yourself with knowledge so that you can sit down when things happen and say, look here, this was predictive. This was, God is real. God gives us prophecy to prove He's real because He foretells it thousands of years in advance and then He does it and we get to see it. I, I have to ask you this. Yeah. It seems as though everything is happening so quickly, uh -huh. the bad, the good, the ugly, everything <laughs> in the Bible is, is why you call it a prophetic crunch time. Explain that. Okay. God counts time by sabbatical cycles. God, God counts uh, uh, times by covenant. And God, in fact, there's different ways God counts time, okay? Now, one of the things that begins to happen, there's a, there's a verse in Matthew 24 where Jesus said, there'll be wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquake. Right. The skeptic says to me, that's always been happening. Why do you get so caught up on that? It's been going on since the beginning of time almost. But in one other, same Luke 21, uh, Mark 13, Matthew 24, one of the writers says this, when all these things begin to come to pass, all these things combined, now there's your clue. Never has there been a time, I was reading the other day how many wars and rumors of wars are, more than in history, right now, whether it's Africa, whether it's Middle East, more than any time in history as far as the whole world's concerned. Number of earthquakes have increased in intensity, and uh, even in the United States, we're having, uh, Connecticut's having earthquakes. Are you kidding me? Oklahoma has so many a day. Are you kidding me? These are places that you never hear of. They've just, they just found out there's a two-mile two fault line that runs through Irvine, California, uh, Texas, Irvine, Texas, right there. These are places you never hear of, okay? And then, when, so in other words, when all these things begin to come to pass at once, that's how Jesus said, you're in the last days. That's when you need to start looking up and lifting up your head. This your meeting, meeting, a message story. that the Holy Spirit revealed to me recently called a prophetic message from the D.C. earthquake, the cracks on the Washington Monument and the National Cathedral. In Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, we read this. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace. Now, notice this makes for your peace, having peace in the land. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies shall build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave to you one stone upon another. This did happen, of course, about 40 years later in 70 AD at the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus concludes it by saying this, because you did not know the time of your visitation. 
When I did this message, I looked up the Greek word visitation and found out it's the Greek word episcope. An episcope is an inspection that brings relief, an inspection that brings relief. And what Jesus is saying here is if you would have listened to me and paid attention to what I was telling you, I would have brought you relief and I would have brought you peace to your city and to your life, but you missed the time of the episcope, the time of my visiting you in order to help you. See, God would bring relief, but they weren't listening. And I'm going to show you in a moment why it's significant for me to read this verse about Israel and yet preach on America. It's because our patterns, as many of you know if you followed our ministry over the years, are very parallel to the nation of Israel. We are connected by a spiritual umbilical cord. What is odd is this. Years ago, a hotel wanted to build on top of the Mount of Olives, which would have been the best everybody in the world would have stayed at that hotel. You'd have had a view of the Eastern Gate, the Temple Mount at night. But guess what? When they did the ground surveys, it is the most unstable part of the entire area. Because there is today an earthquake fault line that runs on the Mount of Olives. And you can actually see it if you know what you're doing. You can see it because if you go into what's called the Kidron Valley, and the Kidron Valley, let me explain it to you again, is those olive trees at the base. This picture's being taken near, not far from the Garden of Gethsemane. You see the pinnacle of the temple in the distance up at the top wall where the eastern and southern wall of the city of Jerusalem meet. But right down there you see, as you walk this, and many of you have done this, you see rocks that are just dropping. And you see a sharp edge, a sharp uh, uh, series of rocks, like the, the bedrock of the city. But it's dropped off, and you got all these little rocks that are laying. And you see it all the way down through the Kidron Valley. Now, the point that I'm making is this. Everybody catch this little statement that I'm going to make. For 2,500 years, God has had in Israel... A fault line <laughs> that although they may never have understood what it was in the past perhaps Isaiah knew perhaps the Holy Spirit just told him but he knew the, he knew the Messiah would come back to the Mount of Olives that's the main point but there has been a reminder somebody shout reminder there has been a reminder in Israel for 2,500 years of what is about to happen in the future. Do you mind going now to Washington, D.C. with me? Shout amen. amen. Most of you are aware of the fact that there was a earthquake that shook Washington, D.C. and up the coastline and are aware of the fact that it did damage to several major buildings in Washington. Now this young lady, I'm not going to embarrass her because she's a very humble young girl I'll not have her stand but she's here on May 2011 Lauren who's one of our youth group with the extreme was at the prayer barn praying right there at the upper top of the prayer barn in Cleveland there was probably about 30 of us present that night and she doesn't know this and I will ne I, I would never embarrass her but I watch my kids pray I call them my kids you just have to bear with me I'm old enough to be their dad but when I watch them pray, I see how some get so lost. But Lauren will have a notebook and she'll pray and she'll look off in the distance. She's paying no attention to anybody. She got in the spirit and wrote this down in May, in May of 2011. I see a shaking coming to Washington, D.C. Both in the spiritual and natural. Now remember, spiritual, natural. When I was looking at the map, it was shaking. That the shaking shot out in four directions, north, south, east, and west. This earthquake did just that. It went in all directions. It was felt all the way up in the northeast. It completely shook the political realm. Now she's going off into a realm of seeing something in the spirit. Now, she gave a word of people who everybody thought would run for president. And that day, she said, that one won't run and that one won't run. And so help me if both of those people did not run when everybody said they were going to. So she hit it right on the head. But then she continued to write and said, I feel a huge literal earthquake 
that shakes and changes. Now, this is later. This is down the road. The East Coast is coming. And as a sign, they'll be, listen, when this earthquake happens, the literal one, it'll be a sign of all new leadership coming to Washington. Now, I happen to believe if she's got 80% of it right so far, she's probably got the last part right by the Spirit of God. Now, having said that, listen carefully. On Tuesday, August the 23rd, at 1.15 Eastern Standard Time, a 5.8 quake shook D.C. all the way up to New York into Canada. Now, let's go there. Follow me quickly. I'm going to talk fast, which I normally don't do. What are you laughing about? Let me talk about the National Cathedral. Since 1912, it has been called the spiritual home for the nation in the time of crisis. It's an Episcopal cathedral erected just prior to World War I and is made of limestone. It is located in the northwestern area of Washington, D.C., near foreign embassies and not far from the vice president residence. Now, when the earthquake took place, there were four tall spires on top of the National Cathedral. The one on the right was broken off and crashed on the steps of Pilgrim's Road. Three of the four spires were complete, were very much damaged with parts missing and will need millions of dollars in repair. And they even said that it looks like the central tower is leaning just slightly. Carved angels fell to the ground. Now, the four spires is interesting because when I look at something like this and believe it's prophetic, I say to myself, what is four spires? They're all equal. They all basically look alike. Then I remembered that on the temple furniture, all the temple furniture where you were supposed to have a meeting with God, the brass altar had four horns. The golden altar had four horns. What is the brass altar where you offer your body a living sacrifice? That's the prophetic picture now. What is the golden altar where you pray? What do you do in a cathedral? You pray. And I see the four horns of the altar, golden altar, that's supposed to be the place where the nation is supposed to be praying, represented by this great national cathedral. And I see that three of the four spires are broken off at the top. Remember when, the, when Christ died in Jerusalem, the veil was torn and there was a great earthquake. Then there was the Washington Monument, built to honor George Washington, to honor his work in our independence is the first president. The cornerstone was laid July 4th, 1848. It was 100 years actually before Israel would be a nation when that cornerstone was laid. Now here's some interesting facts that you may not be aware of. It was completed, the Washington Monument was completed on December 6th, 1844 and is 555.5 feet and an eighth inch high, which happens to be a total of 6,666 and an eighth inches. 555.5 feet and one eighth inch high translates to 6,666 and eighth inches. It's 500 feet from the ground to the top when you look at it from the outside. If you're at ground level, going to the top, 555 feet, but it happens to be 111 feet in the ground, making a total of 666. Oh, you're not getting it. The number of man, the number of mankind, a city built for a man by men. However, the Washington Monument is an obelisk. Uh, and uh, that, that word in Greek means needle. In, 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 in Egyptian, in, in, you see it as an Egyptian emblem. It's found in Egyptian tombs and temples. And it's related to the sun god Ra. It was said to have magical powers to be able to protect the area where it covers. On the top of the obelisk and the Washington Monument is a pyramid called a pyramidion. But at the top, interesting enough, on the inside is on the aluminum top of it are the words, Praise be unto God. Now, let me share with you something that I think you'll find extremely interesting relating to this. The epicenter of the earthquake that affected Washington, D.C., affecting two of our main buildings, watch, the spiritual building representing the spirituality of our nation and the one building worldwide understand, we understand as the political. When you see Washington Monument, you think of the United States and you think of Washington. When you see the White House, you think of the president. 
When you see the Capitol, you think of Congress. That monument is the monument representing America. When you see the Washington Monument, you think of the American people, George Washington. Would you agree with me on that? So one is a monument that alludes to politics, and the other is a monument that alludes to our spirituality as a nation. All right. A couple years back, some things began to happen in America. Bill Cloud was working with me then. I called Bill. I said, let's find out what the Torah reading was in the synagogue the same week this happened. I remember when our president was, the, the president we have now was uh, inaugurated in Washington that week. When a major event happens in America, I like to go to the Torah. Now look, the Jews don't just pick a verse out. You understand that. It's in order. They start in Genesis 1, and it's in this chapter. This, so they don't just go and say, let's go read that verse on the, uh, at the Torah reading just so it'll fit what's happening in our eyes. When our president was being sworn in, that week the Torah reading, the main verse in the synagogues was, and there arose a new Pharaoh in Egypt who knew not Joseph. Meaning, there arose a leader that did not understand the covenant God had with the Jewish people. That's what I'm trying to say. So in other words, if you see events happening like this, it's an earthquake. It affects two buildings. I say, what's the Torah reading? Can I slow this down and tell you what the Torah reading was? Deuteronomy 7, 12 through eleven twenty two. Here it is. In the Torah reading, the day of the earth, the, 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 the time the earthquake, that week, seven times in the text, God is telling the people, follow my rules and my commandments. He's also saying, you need to learn from past mistakes that have been made. And he also brings up the verse of the golden calf, where they were trusting in the golden calf. <laughs> now, if you don't get this, it's because you're just tired. God then reminds them of the two stone tablets that were broken because they were disobedient to him. That's tied in with Deuteronomy 9, 11 through 12. Now, wait a minute. I can tell you didn't get that. The Washington Monument is made of stone. The National Cathedral is made of stone. Both of them were cracked in the earthquake. And the Torah reading is God saying, I want to warn you of the two tablets that were broken by Moses because you worshipped a gold cow. America has a pharmacia spirit over it, but we have a spirit of greed. The reason we're in the mess we're in now is everybody was trying to make usury, using usury, charging interest, and then more interest and more interest and more interest to where people could not pay their bills and I'm trying to say the shaking well Lord let me just tell you the rest of it maybe you'll get a little bit more revelation the quake occurred on the 235th day of the 235th anniversary of America's independence the quake occurred on the 400th year of the anniversary of the translation of the King James Version of the Bible, which was translated into the English language. The quake occurred, the epicenter, was 84 miles from Washington. Interestingly enough, the tribulation is seven years in length or 84 months. I think God is trying to tell us something. Mm -hmm. Now, bear with me for just a moment. I meditated on this, and I thought about this, and here's what the Holy Spirit quickened to me. When I started researching of the damage that was done to the floor or the foundation, there was none. Don't you miss this. I start checking, okay, what was the damage to the cathedral? Was there a massive crack? No. Was the foundations okay? Yeah. Now that's odd. Will you listen? In earthquakes, normally it's the floor that gets affected as much as the other. When you got, when you got the top of your roof shaken, you can mark it down. It did some damage to the bottom. Hey, the floor of the monument, as far as I know, is intact. 
The floor of the National Cathedral is intact, but it was the top of the buildings that shook. All right now, I'm going to have to go there whether I want to go there or not. You've heard it with your ears. I say nothing that is not known. I say nothing that you have not already heard. There is a group. Some of them are billionaire, billionaire, billionaire businessmen. Some of them are socialist professors that are now czars in Washington. Some of them happen to be congressmen, senators, and congresswomen. And some even go into higher places. And their goal, as they have stated with their own words, is we are going to fundamentally change America. Now, when the words fundamentally change something come to me, I immediately think of the foundation of something because your fundamentals are your foundation. Now, if you're not getting it tonight, let me explain it to you. The foundation, if I'm going to, if I'm going to fundamentally change the foundation of the house, that means I've got to go down and go to the basement and mess with the concrete in the basement. What is the fundamentals of a tree? The fundamentals of a tree are its roots. What is the fundamental of sports? The fundamentals of sports is you teach a kid before they can ever make a touchdown how to run a ball, how to kick a ball, how to pass a ball, how to catch a ball. You teach them the fundamentals of block. If you don't teach the fundamentals, which are the basics, which are the foundation, you'll never win a game. What is the foundation of America? You better hear what I'm saying. When somebody stands in my face and says, we're going to fundamentally change America, I am reminded what my fundamentals are. First of all, my fundamental foundation is the Christian faith. Secondly, my fundamental foundation is the church in America. Thirdly, my fundamental foundation is marriage is between a man and a woman. My faith, my freedoms, my family, mm -hmm. and the fact of looking at God's Word and making it the foundation. Great, Lord, I think it's time to give you the Word the Lord gave me. If this don't make you get up and shout, I'm going to throw a microphone at somebody, so just duck when it comes. The Spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, now, son, I'm going to tell you prophetically why. That the top of the National Cathedral shook, but the foundation stayed sure. I'm going to tell you why the top of the Washington Monument has three cracks out of four places, but the foundation remained. I said, Lord, speak on. He said, son, it's because there's a whole group of people that came to power who said, I'm going to fundamentally change it. But God says the foundation of America is too strong for a group of left-wing liberal politicians politicians and left-wing liberal leaders to come and shake that foundation. I don't mind preaching right here. What is the foundation of America? It's a group of founders that were Christians. What is the foundation of America? It's the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution that is based upon the Word of God and upon Scripture. What is the foundation of America? It's preachers and politicians allowing each other to pray and have freedom to pray and call on God in public places. What is the foundation of America? In the early days, our presidents called people to fasting and all called people to prayer. What is the foundation of America? It's revival. And I'm telling you, as long as this Tennessee preacher has got breath in his body and blood flowing through his veins, I will tell you, you, sir, and you, ma'am, will not change the foundation and the fundamentals of a nation that's built on a covenant with all Almighty God, you might shake at the top, but you're not going to shake at the bottom. Hallelujah! Because of that. Three things he said will happen to America. Called the punishment of America. 
Uh, Dave Wilkerson said, I believe God is going to judge this nation with three instruments of destruction. They are earthquakes, droughts, and financial disasters. Every nation God has judged in the past was appointed special instruments of calamity. And yesterday, we talked about the instrument of earthquakes. Yes. And like Jim was saying, the detail that Dave Wilkerson predicted is totally lining up with even what scientists are saying today. And other prophets are literally building upon what Dave Wilkerson said 38 years ago. Broadcast. They need to get a copy of it somehow. Yes. But these are not just earthquakes. This is what I've been trying to tell you. Earthquakes won't cause people to be scared unless they're multiplied. Yeah. Jesus said there's going to be many divers places. just means many places, and they'll be all at once. And the earthquakes that Dave Wilkerson's talking about are so destructive that it's literally going to cause the power outage on the, on the West Coast. Yes. It's going to cause uh, the power lines to fall like dominoes. It's going to cause an epic thing. And he said, America will know it's a judgment in the hand of God. Move I mean, on. he literally described that literally the roadways to get in and out of that part of the country will all be destroyed. Uh, I mean, and, it, and that the tremors and the continued earthquakes that would literally go on for months would make it so people would be fearful to even ever go back. I mean, this is really, you know, sticking his neck out. But, uh, but like I was saying, other prophets are coming out and having the same Don't vision. The dream about is what if we predicted. turn our back no. and we really cut off Israel. Jerusalem. And Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the issue. And that the New Madrid, you saw it shaking. Could you just explain yeah. that quickly? I was suspended over a river down by my house in Alabama. I was, I was hanging over it, looking down at it, and I knew where I was. I could see the river. But immediately that river just went like that out of, out of sight, and you couldn't see the bank of the river at all. And then the scene changed, and I was taken to uh, like an old ancient schoolhouse. I didn't know where it was, and I was running through this old schoolhouse, and my teeth were clapping so hard in the dream, I couldn't, I couldn't clamp my teeth tight enough to keep them from clamp, clapping because the earth was quaking and bucking like a horse. And I saw a man in my church in front of me, and it was throwing him around like a rag doll. So I said to myself, it must be doing the same to me because I can't keep from my teeth cracking and popping. So then the way it ended up is I saw like an old map of antiquities, and it showed the name Indianola, and it showed Europa. Well, as soon as it was over, I called my wife in and I said, Brenda, I was shaking so hard, I, I couldn't stop shaking. It, it was like I'd seen a tragedy in real life. I just couldn't stop shaking. So she held me for about 30 minutes and I calmed down. So when we looked up Indianola and we looked up Europa, we found out that there was uh, five Indianolas at one time in America, but only three left now. One was in Mississippi. One was in Texas, and one was in Illinois. But I saw, whenever that was over, I saw a line going like this, this way toward Europa. So I knew that it was going from the east to the west. So when Europa, Europa was in Missouri, and, Euro, and uh, Indianola was in Illinois. Europa is just a small, small place in Missouri. And Indianola is just a very small place in Illinois. Nothing noteworthy about it at all, and I couldn't figure the dream out. So a pastor called me later that day, and I told him my dream. And uh, he got on the computer, and when he put Indianola in and Europa, it was the New Madrid Fault. Mm. It, you could superimpose those two cities over the New Madrid Fault. So then it made sense to me that the Lord was showing me that that New Madrid Fault was about to break. And, and uh, listen, that, that room was bucking so hard. It was bucking exactly like you were on a wild horse. And, and, and you, you couldn't, my teeth wouldn't stop clapping. It was bucking that hard. And I said to myself in the dream, whatever structures were, they are no more. Mm. Oh. So I, I have believed that, that New Madrid is in, the, is in the center of our country. And... The Great Lakes are up top and the Gulf is at the bottom. What I believe I saw when that river went out of sight 
is I believe that the Great Lakes was busted loose and the water started draining down. And I believe the, the Gulf water started draining up. And that's why the waters went out of sight all of a sudden. I think it split America right in half. So what I felt in my spirit, and I can't prove this, I just felt it in my spirit. I felt like the Lord was saying to me, if they divide Jerusalem, if America has a hand mm -hmm. in causing, if the Secretary of State or the President or whoever has a hand in causing Israel to divide Jerusalem and giving up that land for peace, I will divide America. Mm -hmm. And I believe that to this day. I can't prove that. But I believe that to this day. But I will say this. I will say this. And you can, you can mark this down as a prophetic word. In the days to come, you're going to see earthquakes that will startle you. Yes. Because as sin increases, the land will manifest greater than it ever has. And this New Madrid, I'm sure you've studied it since, the vision. I had no idea these, these two cities of the same name and, and, and mm -hmm. you know when you looked on that map it had to sh shock you that uh, you know and and that uh, I for what was what was the year the it, it shook before when the Mississippi Mississippi ran yeah when what it, it, it see it was up. the largest earthquake probably in the history of America in the past. It rang church bells in Boston. Right. That's how powerful yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. And that, that shook, and that river ran backwards. And if it happens now, that was not in modern times. Mm -hmm. You know, it was in early mm -hmm. America. And so if that thing happens now, millions could die. Uh, you feel like maybe even all the bridges would go, and literally it would divide America. For well, a period you, of time, and you couldn't even get across. The train rails would be disrupted. Trains couldn't run. Trucks would not be able to connect mm -hmm. because the earth would split. Mm -hmm. The waters would come down. So basically, America would be split in half, just like they would be splitting Jerusalem in half. But Jim, in the last days, the Bible never said that Israel would be the issue. The Bible said in the last days, Jerusalem would be the issue. Mm. When God brought the children of Israel back from the four corners of the earth, he said they'll never be uprooted. But he said in the last days, Zechariah made the prophecy that Jerusalem would become a cup of trembling to all nations, and that means the United Nations. And it said anybody that mishandles Jerusalem would be cut in pieces or broken into splinters. So uh, I, I don't think that... I, I, here, here's what I would like to say. The next person that's elected president, or including this president, I just wish it was some way possible that the Holy Spirit could raise up a prophet are a very influential minister mm -hmm. to be able to go in and warn the president in person. Mm. If you divide Jerusalem, it's going to destroy America. Mm. Yes, amen. And, and I believe that the next man that runs for president, his greatest thing on his plate would not be the economy. It would not be jobs. It would not be urban renewal. The greatest thing that he would need to be conscientious of is how am I going to handle Obama's Jerusalem? doing everything he can to undermine Israel and to really stab Prime Minister Netanyahu in the back. And it's becoming more apparent each and every day. As we see here in this article from Michael Snyder at the end of the American Dream, it says Obama administration, a UN resolution that would divide Israel and Jerusalem is back in play. Now, before we begin, I can't view the whole article because I don't have a subscription um, to the Wall Street Journal, but you can see the headline here, White House Working on Renewed Mideast Peace Push. The U.S. is discussing plans to revive Middle East talks before Obama leaves office, including possible Security Council resolution, senior U.S. officials say. So this comes to you straight from the news. It says, according to the Wall Street Journal, the White House is considering drastic measures to reboot the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Among those measures is a U.N. Security Council resolution that would set the parameters for a two-state solution and that would recognize East Jerusalem as the official capital of a Palestinian state. If Barack Obama makes this move, it will almost certainly be before the election in November. I had previously reported that France was ready to introduce a similar UN Security Council resolution back in September, but at that time the French backed off because they did not have full support 
from the Obama administration. But now that Obama is approaching the end of his term, he suddenly seems more willing to make a bold move. Now, this isn't all I'm going to share with you. This goes much deeper. If Obama does indeed do this, everyone, we are in big trouble. And when I say big trouble, I don't just mean uh, to put it lightly as in just big the alone. Entire towns in Ecuador have been reduced to piles of rubble. But as the president of that nation said today, buildings can be rebuilt. The priority as nightfall nears tonight is finding survivors. Officials say the earthquake Saturday evening killed at least 238 people and injured more than 1,500 with a magnitude of 7.8. It was the strongest earthquake to hit Ecuador since 1979. Two, there's 7.8 killing. killing more than 200 injuries and little well more than 24 hours. At least 27 people are known to have died in the quakes, and scores are thought to be trapped under collapsed buildings. Huang Jie has the details. This brings the death toll from the two earthquakes to at least 29, as the 6.5 magnitude quake that hit the same region on Thursday night killed 10 people. While the exact number of casualties remains unclear, evacuees had another sleepless night. It's Lindley Oz with all the news clips I just showed to you. I think it's very important that we take a look at David Wilkerson's 1974 vision and prophecy. Now, I've got some more news clips to share with you, and they are pretty mind-blowing, so be sure and stay with me. But let's take a look at his prophecy. I think it's something that we really need to be more prayerful about and take more seriously. It says, Earthquakes Coming to the United States. David Wilkerson stated, The United States is going to experience in the future the most tragic earthquakes in its history. One day soon, this nation will be reeling under the impact of the biggest news story of modern times. It will be coverage of the biggest, most disastrous earthquake in history. It will cause widespread panic and fear. Without a doubt, it will become one of the most completely reported earthquakes ever. Television networks will suspend all programming and carry all-day coverage. Another earthquake, possibly in Japan, may precede the one that I see coming here. There is not the slightest doubt in my mind about this forthcoming massive earthquake in our continent. Now, pay attention there. A lot of people have thought that David Wilkerson may have been speaking about the 2011 earthquake that happened. Now, of course, this was a prophecy at the time. So it was something, a vision that he saw, something prophetic God gave to him. They thought maybe it was the 2011 uh, Japan earthquake that you just saw in the news clips that just about everyone knows about. But now looking at recent events in Japan and these big earthquakes they've had, the question begs to be asked, maybe there's another big one coming that hasn't happened yet and even bigger than the ones that just happened? And if so, will this terrible thing David Wilkerson is talking about happen shortly after that? Okay, we just saw two Actually, I should say three, back to back. We saw the ones in Japan and then the massive one in Ecuador. Like I said, we really need to be paying attention. These things are by no means coincidence. In fact, biblically speaking, earthquakes always represent God's judgment. I am not at all convinced that this earthquake will take place in California in fact, I believe it is going to take place where it is least expected. Now, I'm going to show you some evidence of that here in a little bit. I'm going to show you some video clips, then I'll show that to you, where it is least expected in the Cascadia subduction zone. It even states as such in the headline. I'll show you that. This terrible earthquake may happen in an area that is not known as an earthquake belt, well, the Cascadia subduction zone is just that. It is a subduction zone. It is not known as an earthquake belt. It will be so high on the Richter scale that it will trigger two other major earthquakes. 
Is it possible he is referring to the New Madrid and the San Andreas? Well, I do have some news to show you as well on the New Madrid and what the feds are saying about it. So again, stay with me because you don't want to miss this. I'm going to go ahead and show you just a couple brief clips of news videos, and then I'm going to share all that other information with you. The subduction zone is a region off the southwest British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, and northern California. It's a region where the Juan de Fuca plate is going underneath North America, and it's stuck or locked all the way along this region, and every few centuries it becomes unstuck, and becoming unstuck, the plates move towards one another very rapidly and kind of like a big zipper, unzipping from north to south or south to north, we don't know. And this generates a tremendous amount of uplift underneath the seafloor. And besides a whole lot of shaking, uh, it produces a large tsunami. And on average, it happens every five centuries, on average, over the last 10,000 years. We've had 19 of these events, some as close as 200 years, some as far as 1,000 years apart. So when a large subduction zone earthquake happens, there's going to be a whole lot of shaking. So shaking is going to be very frightening and difficult to stand up. And that shaking is going to go on for a minute or more. At the same time, a tsunami is going to be generated and starting towards the shore and out in the Pacific. That tsunami would arrive uh, on the west coast of, of North America uh, within 20 minutes to half an hour. So how do we know how big these tsunamis are going to be? Well, the key is not understanding just how the plates move, but how they move over the total area where they're stuck together, and particularly on the outer region, the outer what we call the toe of where one plate interacts with the other. And we can't really study that from land. The only way you can study that is from underwater. The Japanese, since they experienced this large earthquake, now have a very aggressive program of scientific studies, putting instrument down, and monitoring the deformation right out on that toe of where North America touches the Juan de Fuca plate. If we really want to understand the tsunami hazard, that's where science has got to go, both here and around the world. So how do we deal with tsunamis? Well, uh, run inland for sure, but how far inland? Well, most communities along the west coast of Canada, indeed the United States, and certainly Japan and most of the nations around the Pacific now, have mapped out areas for how high you should go. Some of them are very crude because they don't have detailed modeling, so they're guesses. Others have done very detailed modeling and uh, can present to society the chance of it going here is such and such, the chance of it going here is such and such, the chance of it going here is very rare, but this is what you're dealing with. Uh, in 2004, there was only a tsunami warning system in the Pacific Ocean. Other oceans didn't have a tsunami warning system. Now there's a tsunami warning system in virtually every ocean of the world. So when we see this Ecuador earthquake, it says death toll jumps to 246, more than 2,000. 500 injured. We see Japan earthquakes, dozens killed, race against the clock to find survivors. Now, both of these articles, April 17th, April 16th, both of this year. Here's another one posted 49 minutes ago on CNBC. Ecuador struck by the largest earthquake in decades, dozens killed. Okay, well, according to this, it's more than dozens, so that's been updated since. Now check this out. Back on March 28th of this year, 2016, Feds, risk of New Madrid 2016 quake increases. The Washington Associated Press stated, Federal scientists say the chance of damaging earthquakes hitting east of the Rockies has increased significantly, much of it a man-made byproduct of drilling for energy. Oklahoma now has a 1 in 8 chance of damaging quakes in 2016, surpassing California as the state with the highest probability. In a first-of-its-kind effort, U.S. Geological Survey Monday released a map for damaging quakes in the current year. USGS seismologists said 7 million people live in areas where the risk has dramatically jumped for earthquakes caused by disposal of wastewater, a byproduct of drilling for oil and gas. That is mostly concentrated in Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Colorado, and Arkansas. 
Natural earthquake risk also increased around the New Madrid Fault in Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, and Illinois. So you can see right there, just this year, not that long ago, back on March the 28th of this year, see, right here, okay, the feds put out a risk about the New Madrid and how it has increased. Now, this is in the news. This isn't something that Lynn Liaz is making up or other people out there are making up. I'm showing you the news. Okay, so let's go to this article here. This comes from U.S. News. Federal seismologists create a map of earthquake hazards for the U.S., and their risks are up in the east, especially in Oklahoma and Dallas. Now, I don't know why they didn't mention Ohio, because the state of Ohio is also in a red zone on the New Madrid. I'll show you that right here. Okay, the entire area affected by the New Madrid. Okay, the red zones would be your worst areas. You can see for yourself right there the areas that would be affected. Now, jumping back to the news articles once again, here, written March 6th of this year, 2016, it says, impending Cascadia subduction zone quake back in the news. A few minutes of intense shaking followed by a devastating tsunami, the loss of thousands of lives, and widespread destruction to infrastructure that left entire communities cut off from help. It would take years to repair and rebuild. This was the scene in Japan in March of 2011 when a massive 9.0 magnitude earthquake struck off the coast of the island nation. But this is also a scene predicted for the Pacific Northwest as the result of a likely massive Cascadia subduction zone earthquake off the coast of Washington and Oregon. The last time this fault line sparked an earthquake was more than 300 years ago, and experts say we're long overdue for another one. Seismologists put the likelihood of an earthquake similar in strength to the 2011 one that hit Japan, striking the Pacific Northwest in the next 50 years at more than 30%. Now, here's the thing. As I've told you before in other videos about the same subject, the Cascadia subduction zone, well, it's locked up, and that means it is continuously building pressure. Eventually, that pressure is going to have to be released. The longer it is locked up and building up pressure, the more explosive it's going to be. So when it does happen, it is going to be big. And as you've heard, they're not saying if, but when. That is the question. It's not in question as to whether or not this massive earthquake and tsunami is going to happen. There's no doubt about that. They think it could happen at any given time. So the question once again here is not if this is going to happen because it's going to happen, but when is it going to happen? That is the question. Okay, so very important news. You can see here again. Another article on the Cascadia subduction zone in CNN, the quake maker you've never heard of, Cascadia. Well, what did David Wilkerson say? Let's go back. David Wilkerson specifically stated, I am not at all convinced this earthquake will take place in California. In fact, I believe it is going to take place where it is least expected. This terrible earthquake may happen in an area that is not known as an earthquake belt. It will be so high on the Richter scale that it will trigger two other major earthquakes. So what did they just say in CNN? The quake maker you've never heard of, Cascadia. Okay, here's another one. Pacific Northwest in fear of massive earthquake, comma, tsunami. This was written January 21st of this year, 2016. So back to my original point. Is it possible that David Wilkerson was onto something? Now, he has since passed away, but he is more alive than ever before because those very prophecies that David Wilkerson gave that he was called crazy for and practically excommunicated over, well, it appears that they're coming to fruition. And it's time that we start paying attention and start praying about these things. Quit saying, oh, it's negativity and fear. Well, then, those of you saying that, what do you think the Bible's full of? Have you ever actually sat down and read your Bible 
from Genesis to Revelation, because there are things in the Bible worse, way worse than the things that us watchmen and watchwomen are sharing with you. These things are prophetic. They will happen. They are happening. And as watchmen, we are supposed to warn you about these things. Well, why are we supposed to warn you? Because God wants you to be prepared in every way. He wants you to be prepared spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, prayerfully. He wants you prepared. And He wants those of you who are living in sin and disobedience to repent. Get your heart right with God right now. This is just one of the many things that happen during these times. There's going to be slews of other things that are going to happen. Okay, so you need to take these things seriously. They're happening all over the world right now. I mean, back to back, the one in Ecuador and then two in Japan. So pay attention to these things. Don't take them lightly. Pray about them and get your life right and get prepared. Thank you so much for listening. Please share this video everywhere that you can so people can see for themselves that it is happening all over the world and it will happen here in the United States of America as well. We are not exempt from God's coming judgment. Jesus, we desperately need your power and strength to do what you've asked me to do tonight. I ask humbly now to give me the courage and help me to say it from my heart without fear and trembling. In Christ's name, amen. God's placed me here tonight to warn of the coming hour of persecution. The Holy Spirit is my witness. This convention tonight is being warned here and now of an intense hour of persecution for all spirit-filled believers. You're to prepare to be hated, rejected, maligned, and ridiculed. Now, if you believe Acts 2-4 about a special doom and a power from on high, then you've got to also believe Acts 2-17. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. I saw a vision this past April. So frightening, it staggered my mind. And for the past three months, I've tried to shake it off. But I can't do it. I've only had two in my life. The first, 15 years ago, took me to the streets of New York, and every fact of that vision has been fulfilled. I've been terribly afraid to share this vision up till tonight for fear I'd be called a fanatic. But the same Holy Ghost that prompted me 12 years ago to share the story of the cross and switchblade has prompted me tonight to share this vision with you. This vision... I saw five terrible calamities coming to America and the world. First of all, a worldwide recession caused by economic confusion. I saw in my vision at most a few more fat, flourishing years and then an economic recession that's going to affect the lifestyle of every wage earner in the world. The world economists are going to be at loss to explain what's happening. It's going to start in Germany, spread to Japan, and finally to the United States. Large and trusted corporations are going to go bankrupt. Many churches are going to go into bankruptcy. And some missionary projects are going to flounder. And one of the clearest messages I've ever received from God in my life is this. Use the next few good years left to prepare for financial crises. Get your house in order because hard times are coming. Number two, I saw nature having labor pains. Supernatural signs and changes that can't be explained by men. Worldwide disasters that we're witnessing right now, I see as labor pains in nature, which are going to become more and more frequent and more intense the closer we get to the birth of the kingdom of God. I saw major earthquakes coming to the United States. I saw worldwide famine, especially in China, India, and Russia. I saw the world's food supplies completely dwindled and millions starving. I saw coming a new kind of cosmic storm appearing as a raging fire in the sky, leaving a kind of vapor trail. Tornadoes, hailstorms, floods, and hurricanes are going to pound the earth with such intensity and violence that all of mankind is going to have to admit the world is under supernatural siege. Fourthly, I see homosexuals and lesbians welcome to the super church union. 
I see this super world church in the guise of, mis of understanding, accepting homosexuals and lesbians into its fellowship. Homosexuals, uh, homosexual and lesbian love will be vindicated by the leadership of this church union. Homosexuals will not only be welcomed, but they'll be encouraged to continue in their practices. Homosexual and le lesbian ministers will not only be ordained and given places of authority, they'll be heralded as a new breed of pioneer evangelists introducing new concepts of love and evangelism. I see in nearly every major city of the United States and around the world, homosexual churches catering exclusively to the spiritual needs of their own kind with full recognition from organized religion. Their Sunday school and church literature distributed to their children will suggest to teenagers that homosexuality is a normal and acceptable form of Christian practice. Legions of lying spirits have been turned loose upon the world with the single purpose of accusing Christians through gossip and slander to rob them of their victory and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This gossip war will not only be aimed against ministers, but against every true spirit filled believer of Jesus Christ. Even the teenagers are going to see what it's like to face malicious gossip. And now I come to my final word from the Lord. You have no idea. You could not begin to know the battle I've had to stand here and say what I've said tonight. I've had the enemy tell me, everybody will call you a fanatic. Why risk 15 years of a certified ministry where people respect you and stand out like a fool? But friends, I can't stand here tonight honestly and just tickle your ears. The ends of the world have come upon us. And I've always been a positive preacher. I've never preached much about judgment. But my friends, you can't talk about the coming of Jesus Christ until you open your eyes and see that all that's happening around us now, the Lord is saying, look up when you see these things begin to happen and rejoice because your redemption draws nigh. And I bring you to my final word. When I received this vision of calamities, it so frightened me. It so, I was just so transfixed before God. He kept me up night after night, again last night in the middle of the night. And I asked the Lord about all these things. How are we going to do all that we're supposed to do? When so many are forsaking you and people are going into hiding and they're afraid the ship is sinking. What do we do, Lord? Do we abdicate? Do we turn this whole world over to the devil and just let him have his way? Do we pay off all our bills and sold away a couple reserves in the bank? Buy a little farm and escape and try to ride out the storm hoping a better day will come? Do you just give up? How can you look at all the tornadoes and the weather forecast and how can you see all the calamities that every prophet of God has predicted? How can the Christian remain sane? How can he keep his fortitude? How can he be objective? How can he be rational in an age that's falling apart? Lord, where do we stand now? And dear friend, you've got to hear what the Holy Spirit said to me. Just five little words. It's so powerful, they awakened in me a glorious new hope and faith, and I woke up shouting. And those five little words that blazed in my heart were these. God has everything under control. This is what I got. All of nature is under control. We hear earthquakes, famines, pestilence, hailstorms, killer heat waves, floods. Drastic weather changes are breaking all past records. It looks like nature's out of control. But God's word is clearly predicted it would happen. The wrath of God is to be outpoured on this earth through an unleashed fury of nature. Because God is warning mankind that judgment is coming. And these are labor pains. And the closer we get to the birth of his kingdom, the more frequent and intensive we'll get until the birth 
of the kingdom of God. And it was God who told Job that he shut up the sea with doors. The sea can't cross the door. He set bars and doors to stay the proud waves. God said he took hold of the ends of the earth that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Reserved the treasures of hail and snow against the day of battle. He's divided the water courses for the overflow of the waters. That's the flood. He set the domain of the earth and the ordinances of heaven. He sends forth lightnings and he scatters the wind upon the earth. Who does it? God does it. Child of God, in these days to come, the Holy Spirit would say to you, don't fear the fury of nature. God is still king of the flood. And you look upon those floods, earthquakes, and hurricanes, and you say to yourself, that's my God talking. He's calling, he's chastising, and he's saying, get ready.